So our next speaker is Antoine Proves from uh, Palaiso in France. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, seems to work. So, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for putting together this wonderful conference and also for inviting me to, to present our recent result on the, uh, some work we, we, we've done on the investigation of the resonant dipole-dipole interactions between few Rydberg atoms. So here I will only manipulate two, three uh, atoms and try to control the interaction uh, between them. So the, uh, before I dive into the subject, let me just introduce uh, our group at the Institute of Optique uh, very briefly. So uh, the experiment I will report today has been done mainly by Sylvain, Daniel, and Henning, as well as uh, Thierry, who, and uh, Thierry and uh, Sylvain are here, so they will present the poster tomorrow. And uh, very relevant to uh, what I'm going to talk about, we also have a collaboration with the group of Charles Adams in Durham, who was here when we did uh, some of the experiment I will uh, report today. Okay, so uh, yes, of course, <laughs> as many other groups, uh, we're also always looking for postdocs and students, so please uh, come and talk to any of us if you are interested. So uh, the, the problem I would like to consider is what happens when we take two quantum systems that have two identical resonant frequency. And in a way, they are coupled to each other by different means that I will explain in a minute. But basically, what they can do in this situation is exchange currently uh, ex uh, energy, which means that if one is preparing the excited state, uh, the other one being in the ground state, then they can flip-flop between the two, con uh, two uh, configurations. So an obvious example of that is what happens if the two particles, the two systems here are just two atoms and uh, that interact via the dipole-dipole interaction. So in this case, this coupling is just the regular dA uh, dB square uh, over R cube square uh, type of, um, of, uh, of uh, coupling. And what it means is that the atoms exchange in a non-radiative way uh, energy without exchanging real photons, so uh, there would be another uh, way for them to decay, which would be by spontaneous emission, but I completely neglect that here. So from the point of view of, uh, from the mathematical point of view, I can describe all that by a Hamiltonian, which has this, uh, this shape here. So it's basically an Hamiltonian with a coupling strength, which is given by the dipole-dipole interaction, and with an S plus S minus operator, S plus being a raising operator, and S minus a lowering operator, if I try to map this system onto a pseudo-spin system. So in the next uh, two slides, I would like to show you a few examples where this uh, resonant dipole-dipole interaction is resonant and actually is, is relevant. And actually, it's much more common than one uh, may think uh, at first glance. So the first example I've chosen is the near-resonant light scattering by a uh, dense media. So if I take a very idealistic vision of what a dense media is, so that's an ensemble of scatterer, I will consider that they all have the same resonance frequency and also a given line width, which is a radiative line width which I will call gamma. And I looked at the problem of sending light onto this system. So the light is near resonant, and what happens uh, during this uh, scattering is that one atom of the sample can get excited. And when it does that, we are exactly in the situation that I presented in the first slide, where you've got one atom excited, all the others being in the ground state. So what can happen now is that with a nearby atom, this excited atom can exchange non-radiatively the energy. So it means that actually I have a competing process for the atoms to decay, and uh, it's a new energy redistribution for the atom, and you can show, and you have to believe me here, that in the regime where the atoms are very close to each other, there is an enhancement of this uh, non-radiation uh, energy redistribution rate with respect to the radiative rate, which is basically enhanced by a ratio of lambda, the wavelength of the light, over the distance cube. So it means that in this particular regime, the textbook theory of optical response that we all learn is going to fail because the non-radiating energy redistribution is going to get faster than the radiative uh, scattering. So I'm not going to detail that. We've done some experiment uh, recently uh, along this line, and I encourage you to have a look at that. One example of such situation, which is a bit more common than just a cold atom experiment, is just to look at l scattering from the sky. Uh, if you, uh, for example, look at the scattering of uh, nitrogen particles by the UV radiation, for example. Second example, it's uh, energy exchange and energy transport in a biological system. 
So typically, uh, what happens in the photosynthetical process is the following. You've got a place in a chloroplast, in a, in a cell that uh, harvests light, where the energy is absorbed, and another place where this energy is going to get converted in something else by a reaction, a chemical reaction. And it turns out, and that was realized very early on, uh, almost in the 30s, that the process is highly efficient due to the fact that there is a resonant energy transfer between donor and acceptors that are in a chain. And that was demonstrated in the 30s by Perrin, but later on also by Furster, that you can derive a rate for this energy transfer, which is actually the square of a dipole coupling. It has, it's a Fermi golden rule type of argument, a square. So that's one of the R6 typical uh, energy rate. Third example, and I'm going to be very brief on this one because we've heard a lot about that, is the fact that if you want to uh, explain magnetic um, properties of magnetic materials, sometimes uh, you introduce what is called the Heisenberg model, and one over the, the many possible Heisenberg models you can write, there is one which is called the XY model, which is exactly the Hamiltonian I wrote you in uh, the uh, introductory slide. And this Hamiltonian still has some open question, which has what, uh, in particular in the case of long-range interactions, so one of the R-cube type of interaction, like the phase diagram, the dynamics, the role of the inosotropy in the, in the coupling. And there are many people who are actually looking at this problem uh, those days, and we've heard uh, talk uh, early uh, in, in the conference. Okay, so our approach, which has actually uh, was suggested in the early uh, 2000 by the pioneering work of Peter Zoller in particular, but also Michel Lukin, and later on by Max Safman, is trying to build in the lab a toy model system where we control everything as well as we can, which is to say the position of the atoms, but also the uh, interaction between the atoms. So as you may have guessed, the kind of interaction we're going to look at is the interaction between Rydberg atoms. So uh, Thomas gave a very nice introduction to Rydberg atoms, but the basic idea is to look at very highly excited states. And the reason why they're interesting here is because they've got very long lifetime, which we can then completely forget for uh, the experiment, but more importantly, very large dipole transition between nearby states. So these, there is a scaling, which is n square, and the number to keep in mind is for the kind of Rydberg state I'm going to discuss today, is that for two atoms separated by a distance of 10 micrometers, which is a sizable uh, distance, the uh, resonant dipole dipole interaction has a strength of about 10 megahertz. So that also sets the time scale of the experiment, which is then very fast. I mean, it has to be done on a 100 nanosecond uh, type uh, of time scale. So that's very different, for example, from the time scale of people looking at dipole interaction with uh, molecule, molecules, as we've heard uh, earlier during the talk. So uh, obviously, if you're interested in this exchange interaction, there are many other platforms, and we've seen uh, the polar molecule one early in the talk, but there are also the possibility to use magnetic atoms like chromium, dysprosium, erbium, and also related to that, trapped ions and atoms in optical lattices uh, is a very interesting platform, and a lot of work has already been done along this line. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk now, so I will very briefly introduce you to the, the setup we have uh, in Palaiso, uh, where we trap individual atoms. And I will show you then two uh, observations of the resonant dipole dipole interaction in two different situations. The, one, the first one is going to be very related to the first slide I showed you, so just exchange between two two level systems. And then I will uh, use the ability uh, provided by Rydberg atoms to, uh, to tune with an electric field interaction to demonstrate the resonant uh, dipole dipole interaction uh, sitting at a first resonance. And uh, finally, I will show you how we uh, plan to increase from two to three atoms to a much larger number of atoms, uh, larger meaning 10 or 20, so it's not much, much larger, by producing arrays of uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, individual atoms. Okay, so let's start with a brief uh, introduction to the setup. So what we do is we trap individual atoms in optical uh, dipole traps. So optical dipole traps are used by many groups around the world. The only difference in our case is that the dipole trap is focused on two very small spot size, typically one micrometer. So the volume where the atom is confined is very small. We use for that a large numerical NA uh, uh, lens. And uh, what we do is that we load this dipole trap from a cloud of cold atoms. Uh, it's not cold, it's not ultra, it's not ultra cold, it's not ultra, ultra cold, it's just cold atoms. So uh, rubidium uh, 87, we use temperature about 100 micro K, and we can uh, load this dipole trap from the magneto-optical trap. And what we do, we use the same lens to image the fluorescence, the resonant light uh, induced by the laser cooling, onto a photon counter. 
And this is the kind of signal that we observe on the photon counter as a function of time. So you see a, a typical telegraphic type of signal. So this is almost real time at the moment. So basically, you've got a low signal where the trap is empty and a high signal where you say one atom and only one is present in the trap at a time. So this is a single atom source. Unfortunately, it's non-deterministic. And it has been demonstrated in the early 2000 uh, at, by Philippe Granger at the Institute of Optique, actually. OK, and I should say that now there are many, many groups that uh, uh, actually are using this, uh, this setup around the world. OK, second thing we need is manipulation of Rydberg uh, atoms. So the first thing is to excite them from the ground state to the Rydberg state. So the thing here I want to emphasize is the fact that we control almost all principal, uh, all quantum numbers very accurately. We can optically prepare the atoms uh, in a given FMF state. So we have good control over the internal uh, state of the atom. We combine the two photon transition, like many other people uh, in this field, in order to reach a given Rydberg state. Uh, so this is the, uh, an example of a Rabi oscillation between the ground state and the Rydberg state. So the probability to find the atom in the Rydberg state as a function of the duration of the Rydberg excitation. It's very standard. I mean, many people have done that. The only thing that we do which is specific to, uh, to, to, uh, to our work is the fact we operate with individual atoms. And therefore, each data point has to be repeated many times to build the, 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 just to build the probability. Second uh, tool that we have is the possibility to, ma to manipulate a microwave transition in the Rydberg manifold. So that's an example of two states that we, uh, I will uh, refer to later on, uh, that we can be manipulated by a transition at 9.1 uh, gigahertz. So the way we do that is simply by starting, by preparing the atoms in the ground state, excited it uh, optically to the uh, Rydberg state, and from there we drive a Rabi uh, transition between those two states. And this is an example, once again, on an individual atom of a Rabi oscillation between those two states. So that's the probability to have the atoms in this state as a function of the duration of the microwave. Quite importantly, all those manipulations, as you can see from the axis, are done on a nano, uh, hundred of nanosecond time scale. So it's very fast uh, duty cycle. OK, so now we've got all the tools to uh, observe the crayon dipole dipole energy exchange between two and three atoms. So the first uh, thing we do is we prepare two traps. So once again, this is the dipole trap here. Uh, we prepare, the, the, sorry, the lens that produces the, the dipole traps. We prepare two dipole traps. I will show you uh, how we do it at the end of the talk. Doesn't matter for the moment. The starting point is just two atoms that are trapped in each of the dipole trap. And we combine optical and microwave excitation in order to prepare this initial situation. Atom A is prepared in the Rydberg state, which I will refer as D here, 62D3F. The other one being prepared in a P state, uh, which is 63P1F. So that's the transition I showed you just before, where the separation is 9.1 gigahertz. So what you expect from there, that as the system has been prepared, that it starts to oscillate and to exchange coherently energy. So that's the result that we got. Two atoms separated by 30 micrometers, which is a very large distance on the atomic time scale. And uh, that's the probability to have uh, each atom in the state D as a function of the interaction times. When we do that, the atoms are in free flight, so that's the most pristine situation you can imagine of two atoms. All the lasers are off and they just exchange energy in this way. Uh, so you see that they exchange currently the energy. There's almost no damping, so no damping. That's very nice. And so that's the probability for atom A and atom B. Now, in order to claim that this is a resonant dipole-dipole interaction that I'm seeing here, I need to make sure that the oscillation frequency is related to the interaction strength that we expect. Uh, and that's the uh, plot of the uh, oscillation frequency as a function of the distance between the two atoms in log-log scale in order to emphasize the one over R cube law. So the blue line is just the theory. So you see that as we vary the atomic distance, indeed, uh, we, uh, we fulfill the theory line. So we can claim that this is the uh, exchange, uh, the resonant energy exchange driven by the dipole-dipole interaction. It's interesting to notice that from the point of view of quantum state uh, engineering, if we stop halfway through, we prepare a super, an entangled state, which is atom A in state D, atom B in state P, and vice versa. It's coherent superposition of this. But it's just a, a note because we haven't done anything along this line yet. OK, so now let's see what happens if we had a third atom in the problem. So that's once again uh, the initial situation I showed you before. So one atom is prepared in state D, the other one in state P. We see the coherent energy exchange, so that's kind of the same data I showed you before for a different uh, run. 
Just want to emphasize the fact that the distance between the two atoms is comparable to the thickness of a paper uh, sheet. And so it's very large distance, actually. So uh, they, they can interact even though they're separated by 40 or 100 micrometers. So it's a huge, uh, it's actually mind-boggling to see that they can interact so far apart. Right, and so now what we do is we add in the middle a third atom. And we measure the probability that each atom is in state D as a function of time. Once again, atoms in free flight. Uh, and so that's the kind of behavior that you observe. So you can see that actually there is indeed some kind of oscillations in the problem. Uh, so you can transfer the energy actually much faster when you add the third atom. So the energy from atom A goes to atom C much faster, as you can see from uh, here. Before, it was uh, on a much longer time scale to do that. So uh, why do you see this kind of complicated behavior? There is no mystery about that. It's just a three-atom system. You've got three eigenstates uh, describing this, uh, involving the interaction energy, which is V between the, uh, the, the atoms further apart, and V over uh, 2 to the power 8 for the two uh, nearby atoms. OK, so we wanted to make sure that we understood this system. So what we do now is we, um, we did the full simulation of the, uh, of the system, including the resonant dipole dipole interaction that we had measured independently on two atoms. And that's the line that you see here. So there is a very good agreement between the, uh, the data and the theory. And that shows that actually we understand this system in a reasonable way. So we've included here all sources of imperfection that we know of and that uh, hopefully we'll be able to correct. Uh, there are lots of work actually uh, in uh, related to the propagation of excitation in random ensembles, and a lot have been done actually in Rydberg physics already, and also uh, more recently in optical lattices and trapped ions, not by dipole-dipole interaction, but looking at uh, either uh, super exchange or uh, other type of work. Okay, so now let's uh, switch to another type of resonant dipole, int dipole interactions. Now what, and here I will use an electric field as a possibility to tune the interaction between the two atoms. Uh, so let's go back to uh, the fundamental process of uh, what is the interaction between the two uh, atoms. So once again, this is a dipole interaction. And now the question I'm going to ask is a bit different from the one I've asked uh, in the previous part, which is what happens if the two atoms are in the same state this time? So there is not one in an excited state, the other one in a ground state, so D and P. All of them are in the same state. So if you want to understand this problem, which has been known since the 1920s, you know that the answer is a van der Waals interaction, uh, generally speaking. And the reason for that is because if you single out one of the states you are interested in, it is coupled to many pair states. So basically, two atoms prepare each of them in this state can uh, be coupled by the dipole coupling to many other pair states. And if you do, you apply second order perturbation theory, you find out that uh, you recover the C6 over R6, which is uh, given by the square of the uh, matrix element here. So as uh, an aside, that's something we've done also on our experiment, which is to work in this uh, van der Waals regime and to measure directly the interaction energy between two atoms, once again in free flight, uh, separated uh, by a given distance, and that's the result of the energy as a function of distance, once again in log scale to emphasize the 1 over R6 scaling. And you can actually see the n to the power 11 uh, law that uh, Thomas was referring to. If you change the Rydberg state, you see that at a given distance, there is a huge enhancement of the interaction strength. So now, it can happen that when you, you look at uh, all the states possible in atoms, some, uh, some states are actually very close to other nearby states. And therefore, they will be maximally coupled. And so, in the first approximation, you can completely ignore all the others. And now it turns out that because those pair states will have a different stock shift than the state you're interested in, you can tune relatively one with respect to another one, which is what is actually called a first resonance. So if you do that, then you can access a regime where the two states are exactly degenerate, and you are, again, in a resonant uh, energy uh, transfer uh, process. So then you should, if you initially prepare the atoms, both of them in this state, you should see an oscillation between those two, uh, those two situations. Two atoms in this state, which oscillate uh, to uh, one atom in P state, the other one in F state. So reminiscent to the initial figure I showed you, uh, the, the first slide I showed you, I mean, that's a process where one atom gets excited when the other one uh, gets de-excited. But now instead of having only two levels, you have three levels involved in the problem. 
Okay, so this uh, kind of first resonance has been studied a lot, actually, uh, in the Rydberg community in the last almost 20 years. Uh, but all the work was done in, in, in ensemble. And because of that, you've got random positioning of the atoms, and you can't see any coherent dynamics. So it is, it's an underlying coherent dynamics, of course, but you didn't see uh, directly oscillations. So what we've done is to repeat this kind of experiment just with two atoms in this case. So once again, uh, we have uh, two atoms separated by a given distance. We use the ability uh, to control the electric field using the electrodes that are uh, around the lens. And we initially prepare the pair of atoms, both of them in the same Rydberg state, and then apply an electric field to tune the resonance before the atoms do not interact. And then with an electric field, I start, uh, I'm just sitting on the resonance, and the atoms will start to interact. And at the end of the day, I freeze the evolution and I read out the state of the system. And what you expect is, once again, an oscillation with an oscillation frequency, which is given by the interaction strength. So that's the kind of curve that we see for different type of distance between the two atoms, so far apart or closer apart. So you see this oscillation. That's the probability that the two atoms are in state DD at the, at the end of the measure, so the initial, uh, the initial state, uh, as a function of the interaction time. Once again, we did the same trick as before. We've checked that the oscillation frequency was indeed fulfilling the theory, which is to say that it goes as the distance uh, is varied, as the inverse of the cube uh, of the distance. And once again, we can also compare to the theory and extract the C3 coefficient, and that's in good agreement, as you expect when you have a situation which is well controlled. Okay, so that's kind of a new, I mean new, it's not completely new, but at least uh, an interesting knob to play with because now with the electric field you can switch from the Van der Waals uh, interaction to uh, the uh, 1 over R cube, resonant dipole-dipole interaction, and hopefully it's going to be a nice knob to play with uh, for quantum simulation and quantum information uh, type of task. And there are already many people who along this line have uh, either suggested or did in, uh, do in the lab, but in ensembles, uh, have played with this possibility. Okay, so now I come to the last part in the last four minutes uh, of the talk, which is uh, how do we uh, plan to go towards much larger number of atoms. And so we need uh, to have a way to create arrays of dipole traps and make them interact in this dipole trap. So I won't show you any result on the interaction. I'm just going to show you how we prepare arrays of individual atoms uh, in a holographic way. So now... Uh, I give you a bit more detail about the, the, the setup. Uh, so before, what I just said is that there is a lens, and this lens focuses the light, and in basically uh, the focal point, uh, you can have the dipole trap. What we do is before the lens, uh, the, the light is sent onto the lens, we place a special light modulator that uh, can be controlled by a computer, which is reconfigurable uh, within uh, like 30 seconds, uh, something very rapid. And basically, what we do is uh, we impinge the light it gets modulated, and in the focal planes of the lens, what we get is the Fourier transform of the phase that we have implemented on the beam. Okay, so that's a very old idea. Many people are, are doing that, and there are some related works in many groups. And what uh, this uh, allows you to do is to uh, imprint any geometry that you wish at the focal point. So we need, I mean, and that's a little bit of a detail, but an interactive algorithm in order to control the phase pattern. And quite importantly as well, we can monitor what is the wavefront after the chamber in order to feedback and get a nice quality of the dipole trap. So this is a gallery of the kind of traps that we can produce. So for all these, uh, so the traps are two-dimensional. Huh? So it means that uh, basically this is kind of a sheet. You have to imagine that as a sheet uh, perpendicular to, uh, parallel to the plane of the slide. So here you've got the trap intensity as measured after the chamber, and which is supposed to reflect what is at the focal point where the atoms are located. And this is the atomic signal with individual atoms trapped in. And the individual atoms is actually a concatenation of many individual atom pictures, as I will show you in a minute. So you can see that we can have different uh, type of geometries, so lines, square triangles, uh, Kagome type of thing, uh, hexagonal, or mecom, and all that. So and it's very easy to go from one configuration to another one. As I said, uh, yeah, sorry, and, and one thing which is important as well is that the quality of the, the matrix and the array is actually fairly good because all the traps have exactly the same depth within 1% and the distance is actually fairly well controlled. So hopefully it's going to be an interesting platform to do uh, some, for example, quantum uh, simulation type of, uh, of task. So uh, please, can you play the movie here? Uh, so that's exactly what you see now on uh, the CCD camera uh, as a function of time. Uh, on a three by three matrix. So the, what you see blinking here are just the atoms that enter and uh, leave the trap randomly. So nine atoms. So 
you can obviously see that the traps are usually not filled all at the same time just because there is a non-deterministic uh, loading thing, uh, process. But still, what we can do is that we can zoom on each of the pixels here, and we get this kind of telegraphic signal again on each of the pixels where you're supposed to have atoms, and therefore you can tell whether the atoms is present or not, and, uh, and hopefully uh, maybe trigger on the presence on a given type of geometry during the loading process. So what we've done is a bit of statistics along this, which is uh, trying to see what's the probability to fill uh, a given number of traps, and most surprisingly, we find that most of the time, half the traps are filled, and uh, obviously, if we wanted to have all the traps filled at the same time, the probability is certainly going to be uh, very low. It's not necessarily a problem, depending on the kind of experiment you want to do, but I should point out that there are some ideas to go beyond this non-deterministic loading towards deterministic loading of this kind of structure. Okay, so uh, as a conclusion, uh, I presented you a few experiments. Uh, in a sense, they are kind of textbook type of experiments. So we don't learn uh, much physics uh, when we do this experiment because I mean, we know what we are supposed to find. The thing that we do learn though is that we, we've achieved a level of control over the interaction which is enough to hopefully do something useful in the future. So I showed you at the two and three atom level some resonant dipole interaction, control of the interaction by an electric field, and also very briefly that we could control uh, the van der Waals interaction. And uh, from the point of view of uh, quantum state engineering, it means that we can prepare different type of Hamiltonian, the sigma z, sigma z type of Hamiltonian, or this s plus s minus type of Hamiltonian. So what we will do in the future, which is uh, rather uh, obvious, is trying to extend what we've done uh, to larger arrays of 10 to 20 atoms in order to answer some elementary questions, but sometimes they can already challenge the theories when you start to reach 20 or 30 atoms. So study of elementary interacting system with long range interactions, so spectroscopy, phase diagrams, and dynamics, and also the possibility to study the transport of excitation in this system. So once again, there is a poster tomorrow, uh, and if I encourage you to go and discuss with Sylvain and Thierry. I'm just going to hijack an extra minute to do the advertisement for uh, Lesouch Summer School uh, in July 2016. So there is a bit of a problem with a few days overlapping with the uh, next uh, ICAP, but I'm sure we're going to, to sort that out. So the idea is that after almost 20 years where there was no uh, big uh, summer school uh, trying to cover all atomic physics, we'll try again to do that. So uh, it's a bit challenging, but probably not more than uh, putting together the, the program for ICAP uh, here. Uh, so if you have any strong feeling about what we should do, please contact uh, any of the organizers. So there is uh, uh, Trey, uh, myself, Thierry Lai, and Charles Adams in Durham. So hopefully this is also going to be an important event uh, for the community. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Let's start with somebody else. Um. <laughs> Hi. Can you just say a few more words about the deterministic loading of these um, arrays? Yes, so there are two ideas actually. Uh, one which has already been demonstrated by a group in New Zealand. They showed by using light assisted collision in a smart way that you could prepare with a high fidelity one atom in an optical trap. So t high fidelity in their case was almost 90%. So 90% when you take it to the power n, uh, I mean obviously it's going uh, uh, rapidly lower. Another idea which was demonstrating by Mark Safman is to use this Rydberg blockade idea. So you load one of these tweezers with a very small, uh, with few um, 10 atoms, let's say, try to do the excitation, and there is only one atom which gets excited, and that could serve as a single uh, atom source. The thing I should point out, actually, uh, is that, I mean, the other way to get individual atoms in this is obviously to go to a mot insulator transition, which is impossible with this kind of structure. Uh, at the end of the day, if we do nothing, we already have half the size that are filled. And from what I got from people doing mod insulator transition, it's a bit better, but not much, because there are some holes usually in the mod phase. So typically it's between, I don't know, 50 to 80%. But so we're not that far from this point of view uh, of what people can do. More questions? Oh, there are more. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> Yes, Antoine, uh, with, with what you've shown at the end, you go more and more towards a regime where with a few qubits, if we can say that. So could you compare now your system with people doing ions, because it's closer 
now? Uh, yes, I mean, it gets, it's getting very close to uh, what the Antra people uh, can do. The thing that we have for free, but I'm sure that the Antra people would complain about me saying that, is two-dimensionality. So basically, we immediately have an array. They have a way to map their Hamiltonian uh, on a string towards a two-dimensional Hamiltonian. But here, we've got it for free. So in a sense, you know, I'm not saying it's better. It's just it's a new way to look at things, and uh, hopefully with different type of nodes. Uh, yeah, uh, the, as far as the number of uh, particles uh, is concerned, we are getting to what they have. So basically, the largest entangled state is about 15 ions. Hopefully, uh, we, we are nearly there for, with this kind of system. So. Um, I was curious, um, with the SLM holographic traps, uh, trap arrays, what type of uh, trap sizes and trap frequencies do you achieve, and what are the distances that you okay. have achieved? Uh, yes, I flashed the, the picture a bit far. So the, the trap size is still one micron. So each of the traps are uh, basically the, the, the diffraction limit of the lens. So it's one micrometer in our case. So there is no distortion introduced by the SLM. The typical distance can be as close as 1.5 micrometer which is a bit of the edge to get some tunneling, but it should be maybe feasible, all the way up to whatever, 30 micrometers. I mean, uh, there is no upper limit, basically. So that's typically what we get. And the oscillation frequency, yes, the last question, is about 100 kilohertz in the traps. Okay, so last question for the sake of time, since we got to board a bus and eat lunch, sorry. <laughs> Sounds, uh, but we uh, simulate the spin D trade. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't get it. Spin, spin D trade. Yes. Spin D trade, you know, spin D trade is, uh, uh, spin logarithm phase of 1D strong tunnelate system. Maybe in your at experiment, maybe try to control the yeah, spin, we, we, long range spin, spin integration to. No, no, but get it's clear that phase. all this uh, becomes accessible, but we need to learn because, I mean, this is not our culture. So I would be happy to learn anything about spin uh, Hamiltonian, spin. Uh, uh, spin liquids and anything. So, I mean, it seems to us, yes, indeed, our system would provide a nice uh, platform to study this kind of, uh, of thing. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Antoine again. And all the speakers. <laughs>